This video was sponsored by Raycon. Stick around at the end for a deal on these awesome wireless earbuds. I need to tell you something, and it might be controversial. Okay? But let's step past this facade of pleasantry we put up every day. Let's take this video off easy mode. Because I need to speak the truth. I like good graphics. I like them a lot. Phew. Feels good to say it out loud. Because I'm in deep with this stuff. I watch Digital Foundry, like, all the time. I want to know exactly how the game's draw distance works. I want them to analyze every strand of Norman Reedus's greasy hair. I love to pretend I understand what it means when they drop sentences like, Rather, just with the more or less 2D depth buffer generated from that geometry. It's just fun, you know? To see how close to realistic games can push themselves. I'm even really into the not-in-engine stuff, like I talked about in my FMVs video. I watch the cutscenes and ads made by Blur not because I have any real attachment to the story or characters, but just because I like seeing how shiny and pretty we can make stuff. I like graphics. And if you're playing video games in the year of our lord 2020, it's a pretty good time to like graphics. I mean, have you seen Death Stranding? Have you seen The Last of Us 2? Have you seen Red Dead Redemption, God of War, Spider-Man, Uncharted, Tomb Raider, Far Cry, Cyberpunk? On a very base level, it's cool to be living in such a tech arms race, and the developers really highlight this level of technical achievement. We get really close to everyone's face. We see goosebumps appear on Sam's arms. More often than not, these titles will come with a photo mode, letting you zoom in and out and take in all the split-second details that you might ordinarily miss. And then you get to post those details, and we can all bask in how cool it is that Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn has a uvula? Somehow? Another thing that I love to just bask in is these compilations made by people like Sumi Legend and Much118x on Twitter. Look how perfectly they match cut from game to game, a ceaseless montage of graphical powerhouses flowing from one to another like water, a never ceasing stream of polygons and shaders, a mighty flood of the most expensive and prestigious works the medium has to offer. A being glib when I say I find these montages cool. I really do. But they are incredibly good at revealing how much of a look AAA gaming has. The clips just flow into each other so well. The aesthetic changes are so minute. These games share many other traits as well, one of which is that they're all flagships. These are the games that get shown off on the biggest stages that lead press releases and advertising campaigns. For Sony and Microsoft, but like really Sony, these big, beautiful AAA releases are how they prove that their consoles are worth having, that their ecosystems are worth buying into. And because these games are so important to the identity and perception of a console, publishers will invest a lot of money into these things. And because publishers have invested a lot of money into these things, it's important that they drive sales and earn that money back. And what's proven to earn money back? Well. This isn't a hard and fast rule. There are definitely projects like Kingdom Hearts or Sea of Thieves that get big press and lots of attention without showing every pore in the character's skin. I mean, Nintendo exists. We are not starving for alternative styles. But if AAA has a look, it's not this. It's this. There's also an inherent level of prestige that looking like this brings. I feel like we're really susceptible to it, actually. For instance, the life and works of David Cage. That's not entirely fair. I like narrative experimentation a lot. I like bold swings. I like David Bowie. I won't say that all Quantic Dreams games have absolutely garbage tier storytelling only considered worthy of consideration and prestige because of their graphics. But I will say that about Detroit Become Human. This game is bad. This game is not good. This game is a seven-year-old's understanding of a civil rights movement and a 70-year-old's understanding of interactivity. It's hard to overstate how much it bungles its central metaphor. As Suriel Vasquez put it, Yeah, I think the world is worse because that game isn't it. <laughs> I think it's so bad. The thing about Detroit Become Human, though, is that it looks 
really good. Like, it looks really good. I mean, do you see how detailed the textures are here? Do you see how well the digital emotion is conveyed? And I genuinely don't want to condescend towards people who liked it, but the graphics are the thing that gives it that feeling of quality, right? It's kind of hard for me to imagine that this game would have anywhere near the same level of status, level of support, amount of money behind it, if it didn't look so much like what a AAA industry-leading game is supposed to look like. I think we just inherently give it the benefit of the doubt. And you gotta admit, games like Detroit look sweet when they're in a sizzle reel. Seeking to ensure that flagship projects have a symbolic aesthetic of up-to-dateness, officials allow and often demand a modern appearance, however inappropriate it may be. That sentence wasn't written about the games industry. It's actually from a 2010 paper on international homogeneity in architecture, written by Kathy Payne and Paul Knox. But boy, if it ain't familiar. Their argument in the paper is that increasingly global money markets controlled by a relatively few set of world cities has led to a convergence in metropolitan form, rather than differences or distinctiveness. What's that mean? It means that the distinctive modern look of skyscrapers in New York is aesthetically pretty damn similar to the distinctive modern look of skyscrapers in London, which is, shocker, near and dear to the distinctive modern look of skyscrapers in Hong Kong. As Knox and Payne note, the aesthetic of the modern landmark, a uh, Guggenheim for example, isn't just a cool building. It's an indication to the rest of the world that the landmark city is worthy of an elevated status with the global economy. It's proof that Bilbao, home of this Guggenheim, is legitimate enough as a world city that it should be part of the cash flowing around the globe. And when it's the same handful of people designing these buildings instructed to keep the same style as they used for their other landmark projects, things start to get a little... samey. Yeah, every building individually is gorgeous, but... The result is that the more cities compete to be different, the more they end up looking the same, each with their sculptural flagship buildings and generic mixed-use regeneration schemes. This look becomes the look for modernity, for cutting-edge aesthetics, and mostly for large inflows of money. What these buildings aren't necessarily being designed for is the public good. These big, beautiful pieces of construction designed by what KNP refer to as a Starkitects don't happen in a vacuum. Instead, they're made possible by neoliberal market forces, ones that simultaneously incentivize inner-city gentrification, divestment in public utilities and infrastructure, a general diminishing of public housing… take your pick. That aesthetic of modernity might be a signifier that a city is entering the global market, but for the many, many people that won't reap the benefits from that market, it's hard to just go, pretty building good. Hey, remember when this essay was about video games? Now look, that got pretty bleak, and I don't want to overstate the parallels here. This isn't a video about how Nathan Drake's impeccably modeled ear cartilage is causing gentrification, though Drake is totally a NIMBY, but I do think it's a useful model for thinking about how we think about graphics, and what the AAA style indicates about the gaming landscape. For instance, one of Sony's prestige projects for the PS4 was the Bluepoint remake of Shadow of the Colossus. And when the game initially released on the PS2, it was stylized like a PS2 game had to be. Incredibly sparse details, barren lands. One of my favorite things that resulted from the stylization is how light worked in the original Colossus, because devs didn't have the same liberty with lighting tech we have now, the game kind of faked it, turning the bloom up to blinding levels for a couple seconds to emphasize the vibe of a new area. It's an effect that I find just gorgeous. I think the game would lose something without it. And then two generations later, Sony and Bluepoint decided to remake the game, and to honor this artistic juggernaut, to indicate that they were putting the full power of their system and publishing ability behind it, they chose… well, you know. They chose realism. They chose the prestige look. To be clear, when I saw this announcement trailer, I jumped out of my chair. I was psyched. I am psyched that it exists, that it is so beautiful, that new generations of people can experience it. But I think the game has lost some of its visual specificity. It feels to me a little less singular now. 
it fits more neatly into a portfolio. So let's break that portfolio, huh? Let's get a little messy. This video is called Bad Graphics After All. Let's talk about Cosmo B. Cosmo D is a developer with his own universe of games. Off Peak, The Norwood Suite, and most recently Tales from Off Peak City. Cosmo D's work does not have what we would typically call good graphics. What it does have is so much more interesting. Conflicting styles are piled on each other in these games, a teetering pile of aesthetics that somehow draws power from its contradictions. Blurry pictures of board games scatter the floor next to absurdly adorned humans selling food that is just, just way too big. What would Digital Foundry even talk about in a game like this? The shadow resolution? The water physics? The skybox? Houses talk, fire escapes have slides, one building's facade is straight up full of cats. All the normal measures of what qualifies as good or bad graphics here feel pretty meaningless. In the beginning of Tales from Off Peak City, you take a boat through this building that disappears as soon as you've passed through it. Humans are all variations on the same bizarre model, with a particularly hilarious quirk being that children and babies are just scaled down versions of that same model. Babies are just tiny men. It's like pre-Renaissance pictures of Jesus. The effect of all the anachronisms here, all the combinations of styles and ideas and textures, is that the train station, hotel, and city just feel bursting with life and diversity in a way I rarely feel in games. It's like every part of these spaces was pulled from different worlds and just smashed together in this almost hypnotic fashion. It also helps that I've never played a game that sounds like Cosmo D's work. These games are fundamentally about jazz, about the inspiration and politics behind creating music, and different tunes blast out from every corner of the world. A stroll down the street in Off Peak City offers a dozen different tracks, each distinct and specific to the person playing them in some indescribable way. There's almost no room between them. As soon as one song fades out, another fades in. In a more realistic setting, in a virtual city that's attempting to emulate our own, the sound design might be too much, but as it exists now, supporting this wild mashup of ideas, it's perfect. Despite all their quote-unquote graphical flaws, I couldn't feel more immersed in these places. Everything, no matter how unusual, is in the city for a narrative reason, Cosmo told me. It's eclectic, but it isn't random. Off Peak City feels like it has a history, like it doesn't solely exist for the benefit of the player. It also, like the cities we discussed earlier, feels like it's wrestling with the economic change and the conflict of longtime residents versus commercial interests. Storefronts are shuttered. Identically faced authority figures harass residents, playing the role of cops while attached to some mega corporation. On the end of one street, a giant roulette wheel ominously spins. The borough that this game takes place in is the antithesis of the neoliberal homogeneity that Knox and Payne wrote about. Personality and culture spill out of every corner. It feels like it was built by and for the people who live there. But you also get the sense that it isn't easy. As nice as it'd be to keep making bizarre pizzas indefinitely, there are threats both obvious and surreptitious to the city's sense of self to not get taken over by faceless corporations. The look of these blocks, the illogical curves and cartoonish sense of scale and unpredictable positioning of objects, that is the story. Tales from Off Peak City isn't great in spite of its quote unquote bad graphics. It's great because of them. I think we are genuinely cutting ourselves off from experiences by this narrow vision of prestige gaming. I actually had a similar experience when I saw Into the Spider-Verse for the first time. I was like, animation could look like this? I've seen four 
billion movies with the same CG shininess and we could have had stuff like this? And it's not like I wanted a movie to specifically do variable frame rate animation or any of the other things Spider-Verse does. My mind wasn't even aware of the possibility space. I had no idea what $90 million would look like when poured into a project taking as big of a swing as this. And that's one of the reasons I was so blown away by it. It's why I want to see studio flagships that look as crazy as this animation. Because indies have been doing this stuff forever. There's no shortage of creativity in the game space, but I want to see what these creators could do with the funding of a major publisher. And I want people exposed to the incredible alternative aesthetics that are out there. I want Off Peak and Harold Halibut and Dujana and Ode to a Moon and Infini and OK Normal and Hilux and Mundan and Sable and Faith and Scanner Somber to carry the same level of visual legitimacy that Sony's current big boys have. Every city doesn't need a variation on a Guggenheim to be prestigious, but the only way to break out of that mindset is to just start doing it. Use all that processing power, all those shaders and pixels and teraflops to do something other than pores on a sad man's skin. Show us all the things we don't even know are possible because we've been so hyper focused on one definition of good. I will always have love in my heart for an impeccably rendered, dirty, crying Norman Reedus. I am a boy who likes graphics. But what I would genuinely love is to hear that a game has good graphics and just not have any idea what that means anymore. Confuse me, blindside me, dazzle me. Show me something new. Okay, the video is almost over, but I have to tell you about this problem I have. Her name is Miel. Is she a beautiful, loving cat? Sure, yeah, of course. Does she also chew through my headphone wires with Terminator-like focus and intensity? Yeah, four separate times! But every destructive cat has a silver lining, and today it's this video sponsor, Raycon. Raycon makes wireless earbuds that are really comfortable, sound awesome, and are seriously half the price of the other ones out there. I've been using the everyday E25s, and I'm honestly just finding new excuses to go out and use them because I like wearing them so much. Like, hey, why not listen to my 19th episode of Blank Check in a row? And by following the link in the description, you can get them for even less with a 15% discount. It took me a long time to jump on the wireless earbud train, but I am genuinely convinced with these things, and multiple people have told me unprompted Wow, those actually look really cool. Miel, for the record, has not told me they look cool. She mostly stares at me out of her little cat tent. Now, what was Raycon, I look, I like my everyday E25s a lot. Just follow the link in the description to knock a further chunk of money off the price and go pick yourself up a pair.